Hello, good evening. Thank you for coming out in potentially inclement weather. Um, and uh, welcome to PRS if you're here for the first time and welcome back if you've been here before. Um, my name is David Orr. I um, actually uh, started the contemporary arts program here and I'm a founder of the Hansel Gallery and curated the show that's there and Benjamin will be speaking about tonight, uh, Splendor Information. Um, Benjamin and I were introduced by Kelly Carmena year, a few years ago, and she, uh, he he wanted somebody to do a Q and A with at a gallery show he had, and he wanted somebody from PRS, and so she suggested I meet with him. And she said, "I think you guys are going to get along," and uh, this was true because we met for a half hour coffee, and three and a half hours later, um, they were closing the place, and we were still like duh, 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 finishing each other's sentences or telling each other things that we didn't know or all these coincidences. So to say we hit it off is an understatement. Um, one of the reasons that we actually get along so well, and, and one of the areas that the, the, the um, reasons that we get along so well is that we have a similar fascination with myth, math, and magic. Um, and I'm coining his phrase there. But I'm, I, I came to PRS um, as an artist in residence um, at first to photograph some of the manuscripts. And I was interested in seeing how the mathematics and, and sacred geometry aligned with different belief systems. And um, I wasn't disappointed with what I found, of course. Um, Benjamin's process is to literally deconstruct language. He will take uh, vintage advertising materials and disassemble it and reassemble it. Um, and as he puts it, he breaks the spell of marketing. Um, and I do believe that marketing is a kind of enchantment. Um, and he wants to restore the materials that were used to create these vintage advertisements back to a purer state and reconfigure them. Um, which is another uh, reason he and I got along because I photograph things and then tend to recombine them. Um, one of the things that we talked about, which I honestly I hadn't thought about since I was a kid, was the work of uh, R. Buckminster Fuller, who um, there's a lot of there there. And one of the things that there's a lot of utopian ideas from from Fuller and there's a lot of obvious, obviously um, mathematical and architectural ideas. But there's also this, this cross-pollination that was part of his practice, too, in that when he was at Black Mountain College, he would be, you know, interfacing with people like um, John Cage and Rauschenberg and Merce Cunningham. And so, you know, he was kind of a forerunner of the interdisciplinary um, way of approaching things and trying to take a completely new perspective to observe a problem and hopefully come up with a unique solution. He walked the walk. He lives in one of his own domes. Um, and Benjamin is a board member of the R. Buckminster Fuller Dome Home, S-I-U-C -S Carbondale. And he's the director of the Fuller Dome in um, Southern Illinois University, Edwardsville. The Dome Home, I'm sure he's going to touch on it, but it's a fascin or the, the Fuller Dome is a fascinating um, structure. It's if you stand in the center of it, you're standing essentially in the center of the earth. He, he extrapolated where all the continents would be, and you're able to stand inside and feel as if you're in the center of the earth. Um, it's also situated right on the 90th meridian. Thank you. Um, and the center of the dome where the 90th meridian would be on earth is also in the center. So it's an auspicious location. Um, and one of a, a quote that I wanted to to, to say during this, uh, before I turn it over to, to Benjamin, is one goes inside to go outside oneself and into the center of the earth and thence outward to the stars. And I think that that is a beautiful statement that if you only have a casual understanding of who Buckminster Fuller uh, was, it, it's illuminating that there was a very... Uh, spiritual, perhaps mystical side to him. Um, and it also talks, it addresses some of the things that tend to make people come to PRS because um, we are, we're, we tend to be looking for those kinds of things. 
So without further ado, I would like you to give a warm welcome to Benjamin Lauder. Thank you very much. Uh, it is really exciting to be standing here in this room uh, sharing with you. Uh, it, you know, 10 years ago, probably uh, I discovered like a lot of people was enticed by the title uh, Secret Teachings of All Ages. Like I could not pass that up and was was hooked. I read it and reread it and reread it and then learned that he, uh, Manly P. Hall had lectures also on YouTube. So while I was you know working in my art studio or working on the computer, I was constantly listening to Manly P. Hall lectures and you could hear that there was an audience. And then I got, a, you know, daydreaming, like, I wonder what those cool people were like who would come to a Manly P. Hall lecture. And what is that room? You could hear the acoustics of the room. You could hear traffic. Uh, so it's like, oh, there must be a door near a road. And there, there's the door, <laughs> you know, there, there's the road. Uh, and it, it, it's just, I spent so much time imagining what this room was like and the type of people who would come here that it's really, really wonderful to be standing here looking at you all. So thank, thank you so much for coming. Um, and, uh, you know, thank you to PRS and uh, David Orr for uh, uh, starting the gallery here and curating such a, a great show. And uh, Dennis Bartog for being such a good steward and new leader for the for the PRS. And uh, Kelly Carmena and the whole team has been absolutely wonderful. I, I, I feel really grateful to them. Um, like David said, I'm from Illinois. I'm from Southern Illinois, rural environment, uh, agricultural community. Um, and I've always been a, a creative person combined with being a, a collector and uh, from you know the time I was a little kid and uh, just always, always formed collections of different things is uh, I couldn't help it. And uh, also, you know, had an artistic impulse and this latest series of artwork I've been doing really is I'm strongly in my lane with that, where there's there's a phase of uh, collecting and accumulating. Uh, and then there's a phase of deconstructing those things that um, feels like a catharsis of around because I, I don't want to be a collector necessarily so much, but I can't help it. But there's that personal uh, unburdening of the collection and then transforming it or transmuting it into a into a new object uh, that doesn't let the the old material go to waste necessarily. Um, I came to that naturally because my grandfather built his home out of barn wood and reclaimed wood. Uh, he did it because he was always cutting corners. He was like a hustler. He was always trying to find ways to do things uh, efficiently and cheap. And you know, you, you'd see this great lumber in these barns. And, uh, you know, he would just ask, can I tear that down for you? So when it came time for us to build a house, uh, I did the same thing because I'd fallen in love with the patina, the age and the heritage of the material. And it uh, had a real resonance with me. But, you know, back in 2006, that uh, effort was now a green effort or a sustainability effort. And uh, but it was really kind of operating in a, a tradition or, or a family heritage. And after building the home, uh, I aligned it with seasonal sun angles and used a lot of geometry in order to make it heat and cool itself. Uh, I, uh, I really went down a rabbit hole of sacred geometry. And uh, this, this, this um, art practice is, is a result of that. Um, and it really is the, the, you know, the title of this talk, myth, math, and magic, I think are the, the key ingredients. And they're borrowed equally from Buckminster Fuller and Manly Palmer Hall. Um, you know, uh, Bucky was a teacher at Southern Illinois University through some of his most fruitful years, 1960 to 1971. He did a lot of great work. Uh, uh, I was a student there and I, I encountered his legacy through attending SIU, but it didn't resonate on a deep level until I built a house and understood, oh, this was what he was up to. He was uh, understanding the way that natural growth structures build, you, the way the creator's hand builds in nature, understand those proportions and patterns, and then use them in building, uh, you know, a man-made structure. So, you know, it ends up being efficient, aesthetically pleasing and beautiful. 
and it's just the ripple effects really go out in unexpected ways. Um, and that was that was the experience I had with with building in that way. But um, just to introduce the way that Buckminster Fuller and Manley Palmer Hall find commonality, um, you can see in my work, it's triangulated. There's tons of triangles in it. That's a reflection of Buckminster Fuller's uh, geodesic dome geometry. Um, he broke up a sphere into a series of triangles and then used that to, to build the geodesic domes. The first, some of the first applications of the domes were ray, ray domes, which in the, uh, in the height of the Cold War, um, the government gave him a contract to enclose uh, radar domes around the Arctic Circle as an early warning in, in a case of nuclear attack. And those, those radar domes are, are, are still standing, some of them. And then the, the, the next application, uh, the Ford Motor Company needed to enclose this circular plaza, and they couldn't figure out how, how to do the, a big enough arch and dome for it. And Bucky came forward with a geodesic dome to enclose the uh, this circular plaza at uh, Deer in Dearborn, Michigan. So triangulation is is key to that. Um, in fact, this is a quote from Bucky, and this is a, a drawing that he did on a little note card. Triangulation is the nature of nature. Um, there's lots of these little note cards. Like if he was at a book signing, he would he would sign that. So this was this, that was kind of his his mantra that um, you know the the primary building blocks of na nature are triangles. There he is, uh, you know, applying some of them in his, his, his geodesic dome patent. Um, and, you know, the triangle, of course, is a, is a throughout all the wisdom traditions and esoteric traditions, uh, because it is such a primary shape. Uh, these drawings uh, were, belonged to Manly P. Hall, they're from a uh, manuscript on Kabbalah from the 1700s that's now in the Getty collection that uh, was donated uh, to the Getty. Um, and, you know, this is what uh, Manly P. Hall had to say about triangulation. The triune world is a threefold form of one supreme divine intelligence. He also said in modern masonry, the deity is symbolized by equilateral triangle. So, you know, from two different angles, one, a very rational material angle, trying to understand how nature builds uh, in, in a material way, and one in a more spiritual way, uh, using the same triangle as a container for their ideas. Here's another interesting little uh, triangle overlap. That book there in front of uh, Manly P. Hall is that uh, famous uh, triangle book uh, attributed to St. Germain that is also in the, the Getty collection uh, in, uh, right now. But yeah, that's a real, there's only two of them known in the world. And uh, it's, it's, a, it's a real, it's a coded uh, manuscript about alchemical uh, practices. So yeah, and it's, it's here in LA still. You know, someone that influenced Buckminster Fuller possibly more than anybody in his, his own words, he said that his aunt Margaret Fuller was a huge influence on him, even though she passed away before he was even born. He was born in 1895. Uh, Manly P. Hall was born in 1901, so they're, they're pretty close in age. But Margaret uh, was a generation ahead, and she was an incredible woman. She was the editor of The Dial, which is the transcendentalist uh, journal and newspaper where Ralph Waldo Emerson would have been writing, and uh, all of the uh, transcendentalists who were around uh, the Cambridge area. Margaret was the editor of the Dial, and today, you know, she would have been teaching at Harvard like the like the rest of them. But at that time, you know, it, uh, the sexism of the era of the 1840s only allowed her to be able to share her knowledge in drawing rooms where you know the likes of uh, uh, Thoreau and Emerson. And all the luminaries would attend and 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 draw wisdom from her. Her specialty was uh, mythology. Uh, she understand the function of it, um, and you know that's in the in the title there too. You know, myth um, unfortunately has become synonymous with false, which is really really unfortunate uh, because it is it it's how things get imbued with meaning and to to you know take that out of the world, take that 
term out of the world literally is 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 close to making things meaningless uh but but margaret you know she was america's first feminist she was an abolitionist an environmentalist this is in you know 1830s 1840s um she took a trip uh from the east coast to illinois where i live and wrote a, a, a missives back to the newspaper and she was able to identify that oh i see these native people at the train stops um you know drinking and they're we're losing their wisdom as people who know how to actually live on this continent and it's a real shame she also noticed the stacks and stacks of lumber uh, on her train trip and and she was able to see that people are behaving as though these resources are infinite and they're not they're finite uh, so she was like a 21st century progressive thinker, you know, back then. And that was, uh, you know, Bucky's Aunt Margaret. Uh, her first novel was uh, Woman of the 19th Century, which was kind of a, a women's rights and feminism uh, book. And this is the uh, frontispiece uh, uh, artwork for the woman of the 19th century, which uh, you can see that she is obviously well aware of uh, mythological traditions and ancient wisdom traditions with the Ouroboros and uh, the um, hexagram of the, uh, you know, th there's, a, there's a lot to unpack there as far as the duality of masculine and feminine. Um, that was an, another quote that she had, would say that, you know, m men and women are the expression of, you know, nature's dualistic, uh, you know, uh, pervasive dualistic expression. And she felt like that was something that needed to be reconciled. And I mean, I totally agree with her that that feels like that's where we're at as a species. Uh, we're at this threshold where we have to be able to integrate dualistic thinking if we're going to move forward. Um, and, you know, hermetic thinking is the, the tradition that we have to draw on as how we do that. You know, how you how you transmute the past and bring it forward into the future, um, you know. In the Secret Teachings of All Ages, Manly P. Hall also identifies this hexagram as the expression of the Philosopher's Stone, that this is, uh, you know, it contains all the symbolism within the Philosopher's Stone. So now this was um, a quote that Buckminster Fuller often shared that, that came out of his personal, mystical, transcendental moment, his big life's changing moment. Uh, he was living in Chicago. He was, for a myriad of reasons, feeling like he was a failure. And he was contemplating suicide standing on the banks of Lake Michigan. And he was in the winter. He was just going to swim out until he exhausted and sink. Uh, until a, a voice that wasn't his said, you do not belong to you. You belong to the universe. The significance of you will remain forever obscure to you. But you may assume you're fulfilling your significance if you apply yourself to converting all your experiences to the highest advantage of others. And that was what he did uh, from that point forward. That's how he, he attempted to live his life. And, you know, it's, it was someone of his genius and brilliance. It's just hard to imagine how they were at a point in their life when they didn't feel useful. And, uh, but again that's a that's a kind of a time honored tradition to have that moment in your life when you're born again and and that's also another part of a hermetic tradition uh that's expressed here at PRS uh the to be born again in the middle of your life to have that initiation process and, and in a lot of ways from that point forward he was he was reborn he was a new guy um and the the effects of that carried on for a few days like at one point he said he was walking around in chicago and felt lifted up off the sidewalk that he was in a luminous sparkling sphere not touching the sidewalk as he walked so that again also a um, lot of history uh as that being part of a, of a mystical experience as well but um you know some people have actually suggested that that was the point at which he began to understand how he was going to execute the geodesic geometry of the spheres. He jotted down in his uh, diary that, that from that day, 
just a simple line, uh, worked out new theory on spheres. So, you know, and, and, you know, some cynical people will say, oh, he would have written because he later orally told of what happened in that time period and didn't write it down. But, um, you know, I've had experiences that remain unwritten down that I've shared with people, you know, uh, in a spoken way. So I think it's very plausible that um, he didn't write it down. And he wrote down something that was real innocuous, like worked out theory of spheres, you know, rather than was lifted from the sidewalk in a luminous orb. Um, but, you know, nonetheless, uh, he was a, he was a mystical guy. He had a mystical, mystical side to him. So this is, this is my workspace at home. And uh, you can see in the background, some of the pieces I was working on the cut up signage, uh, cutting it up into triangulation. And then to help have like a, I was listening to the section a lot where Manly P. Hall goes through the uh, Sefer Yetzirah, where the, the book of formation in which goes and describes specifically how the word actually did manifest and create the world uh, from, you know, syllable, syllable basis, um, you know, using the, the 22 uh, glyphs of the Hebrew alphabet. And then additionally, the, the 10 Sephirot of the, the Kabbalistic tree of life or your, you know, your total of 32, uh, which is another one of these kind of auspicious numbers. And it's an interesting correlation that pops up that Bucky was 32 when he had that transforming, transformative experience. It was in December. Uh, it led into the new year when he, he turned 33. But these numbers in, you know, places like PRS have definite meaning. Uh, you know, Jesus was uh, 33 when he was uh, crucified, there are 33 degrees of Freemasonry, there are 32 or 33 vertebra in your spine um, that are the, you know, the ladder of ascension to go out of the top of your head in the same way that Buckminster Fuller did, you know, through the skull, uh, which, you know, in the allegory of Jesus's crucifixion, that would have been Golgotha, the place of the skull, you know, when he hit 33, the top of his spine there was only one way to go and that was you know up so it's it's just interesting synchronistic correlation between some of this uh you know it, i not wouldn't pretend to guess how that all works um in my personal life though i i acknowledge it i pay attention to it um you know the synchronicities in the young in sense and live into it seeing the world in sim totally symbolic terms. So um, I've been working with um, Bucky's grandkids, uh, Jamie and Alexandra, and they've shared a few things that uh, Bucky, the number 22 was something like if you, if you, oh, he would nudge, hey, there's a 22. It would be like a little wink from the universe that they were you know on the right path or it was time to pay attention. I think that the other part of numbers is interesting that now everybody acknowledges 1111 and i and i would speculate it could be because of digital clocks it's the only presentation where it's 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 you know it looks like some glyph it's just just hash marks but 11 plus 11 is 22 so there you have it <laughs> but uh yeah the, again with this workbench i i was writing stuff down and keeping it in the front of my mind because I developed making this art in a, in like a ritualized practice way. Uh, I believed and believe, especially in the moment that I have to invest it with a certain, you know, positive energy and lightness of heart to transmute the previous history of what the advertising was functioning as that, you know, it a lot of times would function in a way to make people feel like they didn't have enough or they weren't good enough and really doing objectifying, especially women and just making people generally make bad choices. Uh, and uh, as David mentioned in the, in the introduction, advertising co-opt a lot of the traditions that were developed by the myth makers in the wisdom traditions you know, repetition of mantras, like a slogan, songs as a jingle, 
um, you know, while the mainstream was saying, oh, that's, you know, ancient superstition, advertising folks were embracing it because it's works. It's how the human mind uh, attributes meaning to things. So, and the, you know, the, again, the Sefer Yetzirah is a very specific way in which language manifests things out in the world. So um, that was, it was a big, a big influence, uh, both Buckminster Fuller's triangulation and then Manly Palmer Hall's knowledge of the wisdom traditions. The artwork is a real nexus between those two. So, you know, the, there's like kind of two, three phases to the, to the art. There's the treasure hunt of finding the material that's, that has a certain, you know, patina and resonance and then accumulating it and then intentionally deconstructing it or, you know, the, in, within an alchemical process, you know, that's the, uh, the solve that, you know, that's the breaking apart. That's the breaking of the bonds. And that's where I feel like, you know, I got to have my mind, right. Well, I'm doing that process. And, um, it, you know, it's been very interesting to see these things get transmuted and recast and turned into these kind of talismanic objects and then put back out into the world. And then this feedback gets stronger of synchronistic things happening. And this has been going on for about a decade now, and uh, I'm fully in it now. So <laughs> that's just, that's, it's not, it's just how I'm living. And it's, it's, um, it's great. I'll bear witness and testify <laughs> that you ought to do it. And I'm sure as attendees here, you, you probably already are. But here's a couple examples of my early like reworking of this old uh, architectural elements from buildings around in the area, pieces of signage to reflect, um, you know, uh, sacred geometry and wisdom traditions. The, uh, the, the pentagram piece there is an actual flattened out geodesic dome. That's what, if those pieces were beveled, they could be turned into a dome. But those, uh, that's what a geodesic dome looks like if you just squish it flat. And it turns into these beautiful uh, snowflake-like patterns, which you know, I, I call them geoflakes. Um, and this is a, another early piece that's based off of the, the tree of life with the three columns, uh, Kether in the middle. And um, another synchronicity that I noticed while working this piece was the sign was a royal crown cola sign. So while I'm like, oh, yeah, it's the, it is the royal crown. It is literally Kether. And then, you know, Chokhmah and Bina, the, you know, uh, and then the, the Sephiroth are in each of the little hex, hexagonal pieces. I didn't want it to be like super overt, but um, it, you know, it's definitely in there. A few more pieces uh, in a gallery show that happened out here in LA a few years back. Um, and then, you know, this is a view from inside our, our house in Illinois that we built out of reclaimed wood with some of the artwork on there. And uh, like, like I said, it's aligned with seasonal sun angles so that on the winter solstice, it receives the, the light penetrates three fourths of the way into the, the structure, striking all kinds of different masonry and rock that um, passively stores the sun's energy so that when the sun goes down, uh, it releases it and turns it loose back out into the room. And in the 70s, a lot of people did a ton of research in that, uh, you know, around the time of the uh, oil embargo, uh, and then, you know, everyone was thinking about energy and, and where does it come from? And there was a lot of work and Buckminster Fuller was in the middle of it with like Amory Lovins and uh, lots of other people who were thinking about, well, how can we align ourselves with nature and use it instead of fighting against it, uh, get in alignment with it? And, you know, that was Bucky's quote, uh, don't fight forces, use them. But, you know, there's a, that's a very practical thing. But having done it myself, when you're calculating the angle of the sun on the solstices and equinoxes and building a structure that you're actually going to live in. Um, there's a, there's deeper levels to that. It, it draws you into nature and puts you more in touch with the natural rhythms and cycles in a way that you're living into it. You're not just like breaking from your normal routine to like recognize it and celebrate it, but you're really living into it. And then you're, you are part of a macro organism at that point. You're, you know, your local, 
ecosystem. You're aware of it. Like right now here, like I've never seen it so uh, green and beautiful here. It's like, I didn't uh, truly, I don't think understand this area of the country until this trip of like what's dormant and what's out there, you know, in the normally arid uh, hills and stuff. It's, it, I'm, it's just amazing. It's beautiful. Um, you know, I don't know that stuff about here, but at home, I, I'm I'm totally immersed in the natural environment and f- and feel like just uh, an organelle within my local immediate you know ecosystem. And that was something that Bucky said also uh, that human beings are expressions of local universe information gathering systems, which I mean he's very convoluted in his speech, but he's he's trying to be exact. Uh, but what he's saying is that you know the universe is a macro organism, and the human is a part of that, you know, in God body, as some traditions would have you say. And you know we're here experiencing and feeding information back into that macro organism the way like our gut bacteria is inside of our body, small, insignificant, seemingly, but can is 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 relaying lots of important information you know there's new research that you might be getting more information from your 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 gut bacteria than your brain even you know that might be calling the shots more in a lot of ways you know we are that gut bacteria in the universal uh god body i would i would say and that is a you know bucky thought that way based off that quote that we're local universe information gathering systems and then the Hermetic tradition and Manly Pihal's tradition and the Kabbalah and even you know aspects of Islam do describe the the um, macro prosophus or the Adam Kadmon, the 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 big man. And it's also very encouraging to know that when they said man, that was an androgynous creature, because then they have to clarify and say. And then when humans were created, they were created male and female. But that original, you know, macro prosophus or macro organism is a uh, is a is an androgynous, uh, you know, organism for sure. But anyway, with a, with this house, I hadn't um, been a general contractor before. I have some contractors in my family, uh, but I had a desire in to do it. And this Bucky quote came in very uh, handy to just blunder forward and dare to be naive. Um, If you're too uh, ignorant to know that you can't do something, sometimes you end up getting it done out of just pure uh, naivete. I mean, it's a good term. uh, And, you know, looking at the etymology of the word uh, naive, it's, it's perfect because it relates to native or, or natural, you know, it's an un, you're un, it's unspoiled. Um, uh, So, it wasn't easy, though, to build that house and, and build it out of reclaimed lumber and all that. Um, it went over budget. And it was like I learned like what a you know a college, like a bachelor's degree you would learn. And it, it had also cost about as much as a bachelor's degree in the overruns. But I've forgotten about all that now. It's just fun to live in. But yeah, that I drew the plans in a graphic design program because that's what I was familiar with at the time. Um, I was doing uh, marketing for people um, and I knew Adobe Illustrator. So I drew the house in that, sent it to an engineering firm. They stamped it. I carried it into the bank and away I went, dare, uh, daring to be naive in Bucky's spirit. So that's what it ends up looking like. Um, I liked mid-century modern uh, and I wanted it to have the you know patina of the reclaimed wood and stuff throughout. But you know, all of the decisions about the, uh, the the proportions and how the house looked are dictated by the sun. You know, that's that. You know, that's that's everything for us. You know, ever even you know fossil fuels are trapped solar energy. You know, meat trapped solar energy. Every you know, it, it's everything to us. So you know, and again, that's throughout the the hermetic traditions and wisdom traditions present here at PRS. Um, the story of um, the Messiah is a story of the sun is an allegory of the sun, you know, the, the son of God, (laughs) you know, surrounded by 12 houses of the Zodiac or 12 disciples. But these are all 
allegories and way to share these wisdom traditions through whatever the contemporary mythos is. They, there's just a container for sharing this, um, this ancient wisdom about how human beings can live and navigate in the world. And I don't think it undermines Christianity in any way that it's really um, ancient astrology and, and pagan traditions. I think it strengthens it. It's more valid to me in that way. And, um, you know, the historical Jesus, um, you know, is the container and uh, the, 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 the vehicle for communicating all of this super important information about the sun. So again, getting in alignment with the sun, the son of God. Um, this is another little diagram that, that shows how on the winter solstice where we are, um, the angle of the sun is more overhead, you know, in the northern hemisphere. On the, that's on the summer solstice on June 21st. And then on the winter solstice, it's at a lower angle in the, in the Southern horizon. So the house shape doesn't change, but it due to the, the angle of the sun changing, uh, you get, it heats it when you want it to heat it and it cools it when you want it to cool it. And like I said, in the seventies, when they were doing all that research into um, passive solar design, um, you could, they figured out even the volume of the internal space of the house you can calculate how many, how much glazing you have, which is fancy term for windows, how much um, uh, solar gain or heat sink, which is sun that's striking things that can store heat. And in our case, it's a concrete floor and some masonry in there. So you got the, you know, the square footage of stuff that's storing heat, the square footage of things that are would lose it at night, which is the windows. And you just, it's a simple formula where you, have more storage than loss overnight. And uh, when you live in there, it's like, there's a point where it's like, Ooh, it's getting a little chilly. And then that's the tipping point. And then it turns loose. And it's like, it almost gets like humid. It's like, it's strange. It turns all that stone turns loose of it, the heat, heat of the sun. And it, it's, it's really cool. It's, it's a magical thing to experience. Again, the, that's the uh, information about the thermal mass. And there's other considerations of the thermal dynamics in the house. But I didn't know any of this going into the home construction. And I, I wasn't doing it necessarily from a standpoint of sustainability or green. Uh, I get migraine headaches and I was designing an environment that would not trigger migraine headaches in the tradition that my grandfather built in, which was tearing down barns and derelict buildings to get the material to build it. I mean, the front of it is like a storefront system, like you'd put in a strip mall. Those are new windows, but they kind of needed to be. But um, you know, in researching, oh, well, how do you have a lot of natural light? Uh, how do you not have VOCs, which are petroleum based products in your house? How do you, um, you know, create this environment that is free of migraine headache triggers? Well, it ends up being this um, sustainable green design because the world is actually poisoning us, you know, the way we do things on a default level. So, um, it turned out I was building a green home very, very early in the movement. So, you know, kind of this threefold design process of use reclaimed materials, use the sun to heat and cool. And then this final one was something I came across while researching um, just stuff like, well, how did people heat and cool structures before there was heat, uh, HVAC, air conditioning and heating, pre-industrial revolution building? Well, those are, you know, that's ancient building practices. And a lot of times, you would end up, you know, reading about temple building or, and this fee ratio was something that kept showing up in auspicious architecture that I, at the time, I didn't even fully understand what it was. I knew how to calculate it, but like, uh, I didn't fully understand why it was important, but I thought, well, if it's good enough for um, Notre Dame and uh, the pyramid of Giza, I, I, I'll, if I have to make a aesthetic choice, I'm going to make it on fee ratios. So this is the this is how you calculate a fee ratio. Uh, you draw a line, you put a, a segment in it, and when you are able to divide A into B and get 1.618, and it goes on infinitely like pi, but this is fee. And then you're also then able to or divide the whole line segment, which would be AB by B, and get the same exact number. So and this is what governs all natural growth, like our body and everything. It's based on this fee ratio, which people call the golden mean or the golden section. And um, so, you know, it's, it's just 
if you know you, you believe in a creator, this feels like the hand of the creator expressing itself through the material world. And um, people automatically find it pleasing. And I could testify to that regardless, you know, we're in a rural area. If it's like hillbillies or rednecks or, you know, people from the art world or whomever, they all have the universal of like, just like, yeah, this works. This is because every proportion in the house is based off of the fee ratio when it uh, as an aesthetic. There's the, the, the line segment turned into boxes to get it into a, a, another level of, you know, volume. The next step up is a spiral, but I stuck with this. Um, I used that little um, cross, which is very interesting too. I mean, it ends up looking like a Christian cross, the red line segment to if, where do I want the chimney? Okay, well, I'll scooch it onto the fee ratio. Where do I want to, what are the other important, is that, so that's the fire spot. Well, okay, well, I'll put the water spots on the fee ratios. Uh, bathrooms or in the house based on fee ratios. Well, what else is important? Like where we eat, I put, and that's another sink and a water spot. In the, and so it's on a fee ratio. And, and also put where we eat at the kitchen tables on a fee ratio. But this is, this is how it shows up in the house, that line segment. You know, that, that yellow line would be the A segment divided into the red line, which would be the B, 1.618 red into purple 1.618 and that's it just grows that's how nature grows out from that point so i was pretty stoked about this and was really annoying and boring everyone in my life about this you know <laughs> if uh, what there's like several memes that are really perfect for you know like there's like a girl at a music festival or something you could tell just like bending somebody's ear like that yeah that was me that was uh I was really, you know, I could, they would just gl glaze over and just start going, uh huh, uh huh, uh huh. Uh -huh. And I'm like, oh God, I, I got to stop this. I can't. Um, I, so I'm like, I was going to, you know, I was, I was doing marketing previously and I'd always done art my whole life, but, um, you know, marketing and commercial art is a way to pay the bills with creativity, which was not feeling great even before I built the house. But after building the house, I was like, I'm, I can't, I can't go back to, to doing this. But the, the, um, the interesting thing was I, like tearing down the barns, if they were close to route 66, they'd have like a big metal sign. It was like a billboard on it. Then they may have like patched the metal roof with the sign. So I, it accumulated all these metal signs and I thought, Oh, well maybe I'll yeah, hang them in the house when it's done. And I, I'm like, I don't even drink soda or smoke like these cigarettes. Like, why would I, I'm not Applebee's like, what am I doing? Putting up these, you know, the tchotchkes and stuff in here. So I, 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 they just sat in the garage and I was like, oh, I'll do something with those eventually. Um, but then in the meantime, uh, Southern Illinois University, where I attended, reached out because they wanted someone to help them uh, create marketing materials to raise money to preserve Bucky's dome home in, in, in Carbondale. So I was ripe to return back to Bucky's legacy from a whole different perspective beyond, you know, an 18 year old being like, oh, it's round. That, okay. It's not square. That's neat. You know, but like, what is the, what's the philosophy behind that? That material artifact is just a symptom or a thing that popped out of a deep uh, philosophical, mystical uh, belief that Buckminster Fuller had. And too many people, too many authors, too many critics, too many contemporary thinkers um, measure him by his material output. And that wasn't the point for him. These were these things, like I say, popped out as symptoms. And I mean, that's a long tradition of like Copernicus and Newton and um, uh, Giovanni Bruno. Like these are all mystical people pursuing, attempting to understand God and and then you know, oh, I, I discovered some things that are useful scientifically, you know, uh, let me get back to my alchemy or whatever, you know what I mean? It's like that. And, and, and I see Bucky in those terms. And that's something that we need to re kind of resurrect about his legacy. But this was something that he declared for himself to make the world work for 100% of humanity in the shortest time possible through spontaneous cooperation without ecological offense or disadvantage to anyone. So I'm like, well, that, that, that says it all. That's uh, I'm gonna I'm going all in on Bucky, and I'm uh, I'm not gonna make advertising for 
you know, people whom I don't even want to see succeed, actually, who I can't stand, um, I'm, I'm, I'm going to promote on behalf of Bucky. And, you know, there's your don't fight forces, uh, use them. So, you know, going back to Carbondale and uh, drawing the house uh, for the marketing materials, you know, like in Freemasonry, there's a tracing board, you know, like where you, 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 you draw the, the symbols of the craft. Drawing geodesic domes and, and working with those was like, I don't know, I didn't realize it before doing it, but when you, you physically do it, you're investing it with your physical energy. And then if you're enjoying it or loving it, then you're in voice in, in viewing it with the emotional energy and you're actually sending something up somewhere electromagnetically or I don't, you know, we you don't even have to know how, but it, I'm sure in the future we'll, we'll know, but there's the emotional component of doing something physical, like, you know, re, you know, drawing sacred geometry shapes, uh, gets you in alignment with something that, that starts giving feedback and it, you know, it's, it's, it's the universe, you know, it's that, it's that macro organism that all of a sudden is like, okay, yeah, now you're talking, you know, you know, then you get, you get some other little nudge that you need to pay attention to. So going down to Carbondale was the, uh, the start of this journey um, and having to redraw the house for uh, the fundraising effort was I'm like, oh, this the same geometry governing this that I use to calculate the seasonal sun angles. Oh, this is all based on phi ratios, the hexagons, the pentagons, the equilateral triangles. And then when you discover Manly P. Hall's legacy, oh, it's those are all the same numbers that are the divine numbers. Those are all the same shapes, pentagram, hexagram, pentagon, hexagon, equilateral triangle, even the angles of the, the triangle, uh, the, the, the um, triangles that make up a pentagon, uh, the top corner that, that meet in the middle is 72 degrees. And 72, if you know, is an auspicious number throughout all faith traditions. Uh, and again, going back to the sun, the biggie is that um, on the procession of equinoxes, the, they move one degree every 72 years. So that, that whole you know, allegory of the, the Messiah and the sun is regulated by 72. You know, 72 pallbearers carried um, uh, the prophet uh, Muhammad's casket. I mean, just this is, these are allegories and clues that you know, these are the numbers that govern material growth patterns. Um, but anyway, this, this region that I live in, this is Southern Illinois, and it has the most domes built by Bucky anywhere in the world. Like he actually had a hand in. There's domes around. But we got his house down there uh, in the corner in Carbondale, Illinois. The Union Tank Car Dome is a 400-foot diameter dome, which domes need no internal support, and there's no limit to how big they can be. That's why it's a, an, a great building structure. Um, the, the dome that I work in there at the SIUE campus, the Miniature Earth Dome, the Climatron Dome in, in St. Louis is a, is a tropical garden that they have year-round. Um, Old Man River City was a project that he proposed with the uh, Afro-Cuban dancer Catherine Dunham from East St. Louis to build a mile-wide dome for the city of East St. Louis when it was skidding out. She came, they were both professors at SIU, and she went to the design department and said, can someone help reimagine from an urban planning standpoint what our city could be like? And he came up with a mile wide geodesic dome. Uh, and he, the built example that they had a town hall meeting in is still there. It's called the Mary Brown Center, but the, the, the mile wide dome hasn't been built yet. <laughs> uh, this is the construction of his house in Carbondale. You can see the, you know, the tape actually helps you see the lines of the Pentagon right there between the two doors. Um, Bucky and his wife, Anne, this is the only home they ever owned. They were, you know, apartment dwellers or renters outside of this, uh, 10 year period that they spent in Carbondale in this, in this little, uh, geodesic dome home. And the idea was that the contractor Pease domes was going to build the first one for the inventor of the dome and then go, uh, solving the suburban housing boom with domes 
and this this was their sales kit. They got a uh, a, a a bowling ball case, and they made a little model dome and uh, went around. You know, this was this was the salesman's kit. There's Bucky in front of his actual house there in Carbondale, and uh, this was a little hang that I'd like to like to join if I could get my time machine working. But it, you know, uh, probably about 1968 there uh, with uh, SIU Carbondale students and faculty, uh, he was famous for holding these talks that would just go on for hours, a lot like uh, Manly P. Hall. These guys are prolific talkers. Um, they're writers, but it seems like the real juice of what they have to communicate happens from an oral tradition. And I, I like that a lot. Um, there's an aspect of my art practice that wasn't apparent to me when I started it that has become apparent now that I, it is about subverting phonetic language more than anything and turning phonetic language structure back into a pictographic hieroglyphic uh, expression. And I did, I did that intuitively at first, but I've since read some books that have been really enlightening about what the invention of a phonetic language structure did to our brains, similar to the way, you know, technology is and, and smartphones are changing our brains. Now, the dawn of a phonetic based language changed our brains forever by, um, uh, the way so the two hemispheres of your brain the uh the right is generally attributed as the 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 feminine or pattern recognition uh side and the left is the more masculine or like rational like you know focus on a single thing instead of seeing the big picture and phonetic based language created an imbalance towards left brain or masculine thinking in that you have you don't look at a pictogram and make all these different associations and connections from a visual standpoint and see the whole picture of it that's actually referential to something in nature you look at an abstract single glyph with 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 a pinpoint you know cone based vision instead of rod based vision and that's all left brain masculine thinking so this right handed dominance is associated also with uh, an imbalance towards left brain hemisphere caused by uh, phonetic language and our, per our perception of how time moves piece by piece in a linear direction from start to finish is totally affected by picking up the little phonemes and building in a linear fashion. So a lot of the problems that we see in the world today around, you know, imbalance toward masculinity uh, is unfortunately attributable to uh, phonetic language structure. Um, you know, the, the cultures that used hieroglyphics were matriarchal too. The phonetic, the word is, is from a patriarchal deity. And I mean, I, I, I did art shows called word. I was fascinated with language and words and how you, you spell to cast a spell and how the art, breaks the spell cast by the spelling of the advertising. I was, and, but I was always I was like, well, why am I chopping it up these letters then and turning them into pictures? I'm like, I don't know, just, that's what I want to do. That's what I want. But now it's like, oh, wow. That was the work being done was subverting a kind of this um, God, the father um, giver of the word to, you know, uh, in the, in the fetishization of the book. Uh, um, that has, you know, corrupted our brain development over these millennia and uh, not just subverting advertising, but addressing that and subverting that and putting it back onto a more balanced, you know, uh, masculine, feminine, dual hemisphere, pictographic communication. Uh, but um, yeah, that's been a recent discovery and informs the work that's here at PRS. Um, I, I leaned into it and addressed whatever the the tetragrammaton or the the demi urge or the workman head on and it's like i'm going to subvert what you're doing with language and um i'll share the the spookiness that, that popped out in that in that moment but again there's there's bucky's house there in carbondale uh this is what it looks like now that we've restored it and preserved it and after that effort the state of buckminster fuller acknowledged it and said well we've got some artifacts we 
can send back in there. So his original furniture, um, the books from his library recently came back. That's a circular loft library up, up above the dome. Um, Bucky there up there studying. Um, and I have a story to share uh, again that validates this whole kind of synchronistic feedback that starts happening around uh, you know living in two things symbolically associated with this library in this space. So keep that picture in your head. Uh, again, back to this 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 region. This is the Union Tank Car Dome uh, in Wood River, Illinois. 400 foot diameter, no internal support. Uh, there's Bucky checking it out. There it is from above. Uh, this is the Climatron, uh, the tropical garden there in St. Louis. This is the Mary Brown Center, uh, where the town hall meeting for the proposed Old Man River was happening uh, with Catherine Dunham and Bucky. They called together the community to share this idea about a mile wide dome uh, for East St. Louis. This is Bucky at that meeting. You can see the ceiling there in the background, the, you know, the hexagram of the, uh, uh, the geodesic lattice. This building's still standing. You can check it out. They use it as a gymnasium. This meeting did not go well. Uh, the <laughs> now, the first time I heard about how this went, um, I attributed the that Bucky didn't have lived experience with the African-American community that he was kind of arrogantly dictating from a, kind of a white saviorism standpoint of like, I know what's best for you people. And, you know, it's this, you know, although he was altruistic and doing it from a utopian standpoint, it didn't address, it didn't, he didn't get feedback from them. It was a top down you know, the great man dictating how a whole community of people should live, um, not based on, you know, patterns of use or anything like that, but, you know, just designed wholly by him. And I thought that was the reason why it didn't work. And it, it definitely could, could be it. But his, his design partner at Carbondale, who just, we just lost him recently, Bill Perk, uh, passed away. And he was at this meeting and he said, and I always thought this was wrong of him and he was too protective of Bucky and that this was almost quasi racist the way he assessed what this what happened at this meeting. He said after Bucky gave his presentation and then opened it up for feedback to get a dialogue going about this idea that there was a gentleman standing at the back of the room the whole time came forward in a purple suit with a matching purple hat and, a, and an orange trench coat. So I'm like picturing something from like a black exploitation film. This guy striding forward and turned the crowd against Bucky saying, this is a ghettoizing of you as a people. And this is the government just wanting to collect you all in one space so they can lock the doors and come around and arrest everybody when they need to. And that, and that looked pretty accurate. I mean, you're dropping a, a dome over a problem community. I think there's, episode of the Simpsons where they did that, but the prophetic Simpsons is always there, but um, you can see in the background there, you know, that, that is, is it in East St. Louis across the river. That's the early version of it. it almost looks like a bell jar over uh, in 120,000 people could live in there. Bucky was, this was a utopian cooperative living machine in which everybody had what they needed, their needs were met. Everybody had 3,000 square feet. There was a communal space. This was a, a utopian vision that that turned terribly wrong without you know maybe getting buy-in from the people you're providing the solution for. But this character, this gangster character that supposedly turned the crowd against Bucky, I thought, no way that didn't exist. But I was researching the uh, archives at the Missouri Historical Society, and they had slides of the meeting. And, you know, at one point, here comes the guy in the purple suit and he was, and he had an orange trench coat and a matching purple hat and he dominated the rest of the, it's him and all the slides. And he definitely, definitely was the lead voice of the community. And then uh, I was giving a, a architectural tour of all these sites and on a bus and someone on the bus was an attorney who was, uh, you know, sued like polluters in East St. Louis and Superfund sites. And I, I, I was sharing this story as we were talking about the Old Man River. 
And she was like, oh, I know him. Uh, you can't do anything in East St. Louis without going through him. He has to get his beak wet on everything that happens in East St. Louis. So like they could have probably said, okay, how, you know, you, you get to be a consultant on this project now. You know, how much money do you, you know, I mean, that's what it was about on some level. He was going to turn the community against it. Um, and, and he effectively did it. So it's, 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 I, I say all that it's, it's more nuanced. It's more complicated than our knee jerk reaction from a, you know, a liberal progressive academic community that I, simply identifies it as this, you know, but it's, there's more to it than that. Um, not that those issues weren't present, but there was, there's, there's, there's a lot there. There's, there's a lot to unpack there. Um, so this is another drawing of the dome, uh, the mile wide old man river city project that is uh, unbuilt to this day. But it, you know, it's a real daring feat of uh, futurism and utopian thinking. And if it was an African-American community, I mean, this would have been like an Afrofuturism dream if it would have happened uh, successfully. I mean, it, it, when you look at the artwork for movies like Wakanda, I mean, this is, it looks like the concept art for the buildings that you see there. Uh, so could have, could have been a nightmarish hellscape, could have been a utopian uh, Wakanda dream. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> uh, this, uh, this is them building the uh, dome uh, that I work in there at, uh, on the SIUE campus, uh, the miniature earth geodesic dome that he designed with his architectural partner, Shoji Sadao. That's them standing in front of it in 1971. So um, in 2021, it was 50 years old. Bucky and Shoji worked together when Bucky was a student at Cornell. He had just left the military and had a background in cartography. And Bucky was really obsessed with having an accurate picture of the world in the form of 2D maps. And this concept that he wanted to realize called a geoscope, which was a 40 foot diameter miniature earth geodesic sphere that you would go inside of to get the vantage point of looking from the heart of the planet out at the rest of the world. So, you know, Bucky being a nautical guy, being a, a sailor understood the value of having a good map, good charts. You have to know where you've been. You have to know where you're at. You have to know where you want to go. And his idea of seeing the, um, you know, earth as spaceship earth, um, you know, that, that we're navigating and pilot, piloting spaceship earth, we need to have an accurate picture of the planet. And, um, you know, a globe is obviously the best, but you can only see one hemisphere at a time. Uh, and that's why you have to create a 2D map to see everything at once. And then this was his idea, like, ah, what if you went inside of it and looked out? Then you could see everything at once. And he envisioned this as not just a nifty way to get an accurate worldview, but um, his idea was to put um, little light bulbs all over the continents and places to convey data about energy consumption, resource management, population distribution, and that you would have that hooked to a computer and be able to like be in this geoscope managing global resources so that everyone had a, a equal and abundant standard of living on the planet. I mean, you know, talk about utopian idea. I mean, it's he proposed it to exist outside of the UN and that the UN would use that um, like the cockpit in piloting spaceship earth and that we would, you know, everyone, we, he, he liked to say that this is the first time in history that through um, design innovation, there's no need for anyone to want. It's just a matter of will of, of sharing things equally. So he thought that this geoscope would be the thing to do it. Uh, this is the Expo 67 dome in, dome in Montreal that he also built with um, uh, his partner, Shoji Sadao. Uh, it was for the American pavilion up there. They had a, a elevated tram that like went through it. It was pretty cool. This is the dome in Edwardsville, that translucent miniature earth dome that um, Buckminster Fuller said, a sense of orientation of each human individual within the profound magnificence of universe is provided by the center's miniature earth. One goes inside to go outside oneself and into the center of the earth and thence outward to the stars in seconds. If that's not a hermetic uh, declaration, I don't know what is. Like, 
me and, and, and it happened to me when I went there. Um, I was helping with the dome in Carbondale. I didn't know this dome existed. And a, a sociology professor asked if I would come talk to her class about the social impacts of sustainable home design, which I had to actually research and able to even talk about them because I'm like, I just did it, you know. But it's funny how I found out that uh, almost half the volume of landfills is construction waste um, and um, deconstruction waste. So it's like, you know, all the effort we do is recycling and not using styrofoam, you know, little the drop a 15 story bu building and haul it away and, and fill the landfill. That's what's half the volume of landfills. And then with all that dumping, um, you know, the land, they put it on the least desirable land. So the most economically oppressed people live in proximity to the landfill and all that particulate matters in the air. So then incidents of asthma are high in those populations and those traditionally account for why African-American populations have high rates of asthma because, I mean, it, it's just crazy how little nudges like that have such impact, you know, that go out in unexpected ways, but um, it's, you know, more evidence that we're definitely all connected. Uh, this was an event that we had for Bucky's daughter, Allegra uh, passed. Um, and she, she was a big advocate of ours. Um, she was a dance ethnology professor in at UCLA, and she was really instrumental in even cr developing the field of dance ethnology. Um, Catherine Dunham uh, was, you know, like, like I said, from East St. Louis, SIU, a professor, and she was really important in bringing Afro-Caribbean dance traditions associated with like the Yamvule and uh, voodoo practice into the modern dance idiom. And onto the stage, actually here in, in Los Angeles, um, um, Alvin Ailey is from here. And he, would, he was a ballet fan, but would only see, you know, thin waif-like ballerinas on stage. Loved it, but could never see himself on stage until Catherine Dunham came to town. And then he saw himself and like, I could do this. And then that's another one of those things that just like ripples it's changed, you know, myriad lives ever since. But this dance is a um, Catherine Dunham dance tribute uh, with the um, Catherine Dunham dance troupe from East St. Louis there in the dome. And that was that was magical. So that's what it looks like when you're inside of the dome looking out. And uh, again, like that idea of the immediately connecting your ma micro, you know, human self to the macro cosmos through the, an architectural metaphor. I mean, it really happens. First time I went in that building, like I said, I was on campus talking to the sociology department and I parked next to it and I'm like, what? I didn't even know this existed. I ran in there and I, was, I said, did Buckminster Fuller design this? And they said, yep. And it was just being used as a Catholic uh, Newman Center at that time. And uh, I was like, well, I'll, I'll be back. I went in and, and then, uh, you know, stood there in the middle and you, you look up and this, the location directly above your head is where you're standing on the actual planet. So you immediately have this like out of body feeling similar to like what Bucky would have had on the shores of Lake Michigan, where you're, I'm looking at where I'm standing from the inside out. And then, you know, if it's night and the stars are out and you can see them, then you see the cosmos from the lens of the planet earth. So that if your head's in the center, the stars you see in the actual star field are in zenith over the location that you're looking through. So talk about an accurate worldview. You know, you see your place in the world, and then you zoom out, you see the world's place in the universe. And then you like, you just back you get out and then back. And you're like, the, you, it just creates this sensation. It's like, oh yeah, we're one. We're, we're, it's one thing. This is one thing with one single thing with myriad, you know, infinite parts but it's one, it's still one. Um, you know, I don't know, I've never had architecture uh, do that for me, but this place achieves it. Um, and that, you know, the outside of the building is convex. The inside of the building is concave and it's the same building. So it's like that integration of polarities and uh, reconciliation of uh, paradox that's so key to our moving forward um, happens there. 
And I like this quote that kind of backs that idea up from the apocryphal gospel of Thomas. Um, Jesus said, when you make the two into one, and when you make the inner like the outer, the go, the go in to go out thing, and the outer like the inner, and the upper like, and the, well, I got confused, and the upper like the lower, then you will enter the kingdom. So, I mean, like that is so perfect that all the way back to that time, um, that was the understanding of what needed to happen. Um, and, and mainly P. P Hall talks about it uh, in the, um, when he's explaining the, uh, the, the, the book of formation, the Sefer Yetzirah and the Zohar, that the uh, Ein Sof was in the beginning and it was just a, the, the circumference. And then it, it retreated into the, um, the, the single point, which was the, you know, the tetragrammaton or the I am and left the, uh, the void behind it. And then the, the uh, emanation started happening in, in shells from that point. It's, that's like the um, metaphysical way of describing cellular division the first time something decided to put a wall up around itself and say, uh, this is me and everything outside of me is not me. That was like the, that was the real fall. That was, that was the true fall when the first cell wall went up around something and defined like, you know, everything outside of me is not my concern. This is my concern. And that, I mean, you take it up to us. It's like, if we can like dissolve the um, boundary between us, that's an illusion. That's, you know, that's what he's asking to do. Um, you know, and Bucky used these artifacts like the dome and the Dymaxion map to put that, those abstract concepts into reality. This is a flattened out version of his 19, what was it? 27 patent or 37 patent of the Dymaxion map. Uh, his goal was to, um, flatten out the earth without distortion of the, the continental land masses. And that's a crazy looking shape, but so there's your Mercator map, your normal classroom map up above where you have a, a place like Greenland is the size of Africa, you know, and then you look down below and it's, you know, it's, it's tiny and, and Europe is way outsized in the, in the Mercator projection, everything in the Northern hemisphere which, you know, is also where, you know, white people live, looks bigger and more important um, because the poles are, are smaller. And when you stretch them out, it makes it get big. Well, Bucky was like, we, we can't have children looking at this inaccurate picture of the world. How can we even ask them how to solve global problems if they don't even know what the world looks like? You know, it also reinforces nationalistic boundaries. It looks like, oh, you know, Africa's way across the Atlantic Ocean and Asia's way over there across the Pacific. And, you know, we're separated by these vast oceans. You look at the map down there below, um, it's one island. It's one island and one ocean. And that's what he, what he called it. Um, and it. And it splays out along the 90th meridian instead of the equator. So this is how it starts as an icosahedron, which is one of the platonic solids which is uh, you know, a crucial shape to the whole um, hermetic tradition and what's expressed here at PRS. But this is, this is the, a video of how it comes out from a sphere to an icosahedron and then unfolds as the triangles to be the, to be the map. And an icosahedron is it's basically the shape of like how everything gets built. Uh, the coronavirus, the, it, the underlying structure is an icosahedron, is a geodesic lattice. Everywhere where the protein spike pops out is an intersecting point over the, where the triangles come together. And when Omicron got more infectious, it became a higher frequency geodesic lattice. So it had more protein spikes, so it was more vel Velcro-y. But, but when we got the donation of Bucky's library, there was tons of academic journals on RNA virus shell construction from the 50s and 60s. So this is what he was looking at. Like, what's the robust shape? What's the strong shape in nature? Why don't we build that way as, as, as human beings? So it turns out to be efficient and accurate and just better all around. So here's, here's a Manly P. Hall quote that kind of ties in with this whole idea of, you know, doing what needs to be done, looking at the world, to live in the world without becoming aware of the meaning of the world is like wandering about in a great library without touching the books. I, I mean, I love, you know, meaning, you know, that's the, the whole point of that. It's like 
sussing out the meaning of things. Uh, this is an aerial view of the or an original drawings of the dome there uh, that's on the 90th meridian, the miniature Earth dome. The drawing there on the side, you can see how the, the, the 90th meridian comes through the dome. Uh, it comes through the building like that from corner to corner with the dome there in the center. Now, when this was campus was getting developed, uh, there was no reference to the 90th meridian. They were like, this building was going to be a rectilinear building just anywhere on campus. And they, uh, it was going to be a religious center, but it was an add-on. So they were like, you know, uh, we don't have the money. We're not going to build it. And Bucky raised his hands like, uh, he saw this as an opportunity to build his geoscope idea. And the fact that he got to build it on the 90th meridian, which was the central reference point of his map that was patented, you know, decades earlier, is just a case of synchronicity that's that's hard hard to ignore. There's how it goes through the rest of campus. Now, this is within the whole meaning making thing in the spirit of Manly Palmer Hall. Uh, I got to thinking about meridians and the body meridian and the land meridian. And what do you do if you're out of balance in your body? You got to, you know, use the chakra system to get back in alignment and get back in balance. Well, the, the land in the Midwest especially is certainly out of balance. So this was kind of like a visual to say, well, what would this, what would this look like? How would this, that's the 90th meridian running down the meridian of that, of that body. And you look at the watershed from the Appalachians to the Rockies, all stream across the continent to the 90th meridian, which is the Mississippi River Valley, and goes down to New Orleans, which is the root chakra. That's where you, uh, your basic excretory you know, system and survival equipment uh, is where the Mississippi dumps the muddy water from the Appalachians to the Rockies into the, the Gulf. Um, and then the next up, the sacral is Jackson, Mississippi, which is a spot where like all the cotton production happened. It's a little turn in the Mississippi that deposited all bunch of fertile silt. That was like the hotbed for uh, the slave trade. Um, and that's where Emmett Till got lynched, where, I mean, it's literally fertility and it's literally concerns about sex and integration and coming together and, you know, blending and mixing. So that's the sacral. Memphis is at the, the, the solar plexus there where the power, the place of power and in Memphis is on a bluff and, and the indigenous population even referred to it as a place of power because it kind of controlled the surrounding area. You know, rock and roll comes from there. The beat, you know, the hips, that it's all, you know, it's, it's that level. The heart uh, I put there at, um, at the, uh, the dome. You know, the, the one that's really crazy too is that Lake Superior is there at the crown and then coming down at the, uh, the, uh, the third eye uh, is at Taliesin, Frank Lloyd Wright's studio in Wisconsin. And I'm like, well, what does Taliesin mean? It, it, it's Gaelic for shining brow. So it's like, this is a, I'm talking about like the, the correlations and the feedback on this thing are crazy. Um, I added an eighth because um, this septenary is correlated traditionally with the seven wanderers in the sky, which we could see. And we added, you know, Uranus to that. So the link between the, uh, the throat expression and the heart uh, so that you're speaking from the heart is kind of a, a maybe a new, a new, a new spin on this, but uh, anyway, that's kind of, you know, this myth making and meaning making out of um, geography. Uh, this is where the 90th meridian goes through other places in the world. Cahokia Mounds, just south of uh, the dome, uh, the Olmec capital in Guatemala City. It goes right near Lhasa, Tibet. So Bucky referred to it as the great global main street and because it goes through all these auspicious population centers uh, and sacred spaces. Um, Cahokia is the one that's closest to um, the dome. It's just right down the road. Uh, and it's this mound building pyramid civilization that uh, behaved a lot like Mayans, uh, but it also kind of serves as a cautionary tale that it, it grew to uh, 120,000 people in like 900 AD. It was the biggest city in this hemisphere, second globally only to London, and they exhausted their immediate resources. And, um, you know, they over farmed and erosion happened and they 
thought were out of balance with gods. They started doing uh, human sacrifice and it just, it got ugly quick, but it's like a little mini version of what we're doing uh, globally. But the 90th goes, goes, goes through there. Um, just another little interesting tidbit. Also, you know, with PRS, 90 degrees, uh, doing things on the square, it would be an, an, an expression of uh, Freemasonry. And the 90th meridian is 90 degrees from what? It's 90 degrees from England. Uh, how did a lot of, you know, the founding fathers of this country were Masons leaving England and doing things in lodges on the square? You know, so it's like all of that hangs together allegorically as well. This is another good quote I like, uh, whether you like it or not, whether you know it or not, secretly nature seeks, hunts, tries to ferret out the track which God may be found. Um, the uh, icosahedron is definitely a shape that does that. One of the um, five platonic solids, you see them there, those are Neolithic uh, platonic solids. So this has been a human interest and endeavor for, you know, before recorded time. Um, that's what they look like splayed out like the map. Um, again, this is another, another view of the, the platonic solids. Uh, that's that spiral expression of phi ratios that a lot of you are probably acquainted with. Um, that's how it, you know, it shows up in like, hurricanes and cloud formations. Uh, this is, you know, Pythagoras had to say there's a geometry in the humming of the strings. There is music in the spacing of the spheres, which, I mean, I really love that. Uh, this was a book in Bucky's personal library that was uh, had a lot of marginalia, highly notated, the music of the spheres. And that's, um, you know, I, I love the cover of that book. And, you know, that in, in a hermetic tradition, the soul uh, comes out of the Milky Way galaxy and, and to pop, you know, to enter into creation and be born on Earth. It passes through the seven rings of the orbits of the wanderers. And through each one, it has to give up a piece of, it's, you know, divine knowledge uh, at, you know, at Saturn, it has to give up something at Jupiter, it has to give up something. And upon exiting at death, you go, you make the same trip, but you get restored, you, you, you get your tradition back. Uh, and that's, that's uh, widely described in the um, uh, secret teachings of all ages. Again, there's, a, again, the sacred geometry on a, on a galactic level, a view of the uh, miniature Earth dome. Um, again, here's, here's one where this was a book in Bucky's library and the pentagon and the pentagram are crucial shapes to the geodesic lattice, but it also, you know, they make the, uh, this pentagram where Venus aligns between the sun and earth at five points on its, um, uh, orbit that when you connect them, they make this, uh, pentagram, uh, which, you know, helps explain why that's a, an auspicious, um, shape why it's on our flag uh you know bucky was aware of it and into it um again this is a fee ratio of how the pentagon and pentagram are constructed out of the fee ratios and where you can vividly see the the pentagons that make up bucky's house this is during the construction of it this is a um print that we got gifted by the estate of buckminster fuller to the university of uh Bucky, all of Bucky's inventions, and that's his geodesic dome patent drawing. You can see that, you know, it's, it's a, uh, a, a pentagonal uh, icosahedron based thing, even though it's a sphere, um, that the top is a pentagon and there's, there's five additional pentagons that rotate around the central one at 72 degrees. Uh, this is the cover of the uh, folio of the Bucky's art prints. And the title of it is 12 around one. Um, it, you know, that has some good mystical connotations when you're talking about 12 houses of the Zodiac around the sun or the 12 disciples around the sun. But Bucky was referring to the closest packing of spheres, which is 12 spherical shapes around one central shape is, a, is a, the, the closest packing of spheres. And, the, and what's scribed inside of them is an icosahedron. That's how he came to the realization that the icosahedron is the shape that should govern geodesic lattice. But it's, again, it's 12 around one. You know, it's, it's this whole, it's the sun showing up again in every level. 
This is another drawing from the Getty that looks almost exactly like the whole icosahedron base 12 around one from a, a manuscript that mainly P. Hall had on the Kabbalah. Um, and so it's easy to see the connections there. And this is uh, showing how an icosahedron actually gets triangulated and then bloated out to become the geodesic sphere. Another, another expression of the icosahedron as the, as the uh, Dymaxion globe instead of the map that you know, flattens out into the map. Here's our friend, the icosahedron as the basis of virus, RNA virus shell construction. And uh, again, you can see exactly how that looks like the, um, the uh, geodesic lattice based on 72 degree angles. So here's Manley P. Hall's description in the secret teachings of all ages of the procession of the equinoxes, 5,920 years, going around a 360 degree circle. I'm um, taking it for granted that everybody knows the uh, procession of the equinoxes here. If not, you can Google it. So then the house, the sky is divided into 12 houses, uh, each one, you know, signified by a constellation. Each house is 2,160 years moving backwards through the houses. Um, you know, we've coming out of Pisces, the age of Jesus and the fish. Um, but that is decided when on the spring equinox, when the sun crosses the equator, that's how this is measured. And it moved, it, it goes backwards slightly each year. And in 72 years, it goes one degree. So this is loaded with all this, the septenary, the seven, the 12 of the 12 houses, the 30 degrees of each house, the 72 degrees and the 360 degrees. These are the, you know, these are the numbers that the wisdom traditions are all based on. And because these are the numbers that creation is based on. Um, and it's, so this is, the, 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 those are teaching tools, the, the, the stories, the myths. Um, this Manly P. Hall, you know, the pyramid of, of Giza is a, pure, is a sermon in stone. Uh, again, this is another 12 around uh, one expression in that the base is a square and then four triangles rise from each of the four sides of the square base, four times the three sides of each triangle is 12. The Pyramid of Giza is also a proportionate volume of the entire volume of the planet. The dome that Bucky designed for Edwardsville at 40 foot in diameter is also a proportional volume of the entire. So this is a temple building tradition in which you use architecture to get your head around big patterns that it's difficult to conceive of but you can get it, bring it down to human scale and use it in initiation uh, of, of, you know, rites. It was uh, what they were doing in, in, in Egypt anyway. This is one of, another one of Bucky's books from his library. Uh, if you, you know, he may, he may have been interested in Egyptian temple building. I don't know, you know. <laughs> this was one of the most written in books that he had. Uh, this and another one that you'll see soon had the most marginalia in them. But, you know, a sermon in stone is what, you know, Manly P. Hall called it. And uh, the Egyptians uh, knew the earth was round. They knew the circumference of the planet by measuring shadow lines. They knew the volume of the planet and they built the pyramid as a, a simulacrum or, or a miniature version of it. Uh, and something really. So, again, that culture was a pictographic language culture. That was a. Um, matriarchal culture that was a culture more in balance with nature and more in balance between the hemispheres um and the uh scarab beetle was a big uh symbol for them that's what moved the solar disk across the sky the scarab rolled it across the sky and uh when i was working on the piece in my studio to get ready that was a, that was a directly addressing the tetragrammaton on the phonetic language structure and deconstructing that and turning it back into a hieroglyphic structure. I got, I, I got like too into it. And I, I, I spooked myself out. I thought like, what, who, if this is true and I believed it was true, like what kind of arrogant idiot would I be to be like poking that entity? You know what I mean? Like, and then I got, I actually got scared. <laughs> I said, all right, oh, this is, I gotta, I gotta eat lunch. I gotta step away from this. This is ridiculous. And uh, as I was walking out of the shop, I, I was at the moment I thought I shouldn't be kicking this hornet's nest. I heard like a, bzz, bzz. 
And then I'm like, oh, that's funny. That's right on cue. And then I thought, well, wait a minute. That could be like a frayed wire. There could I could burn the shop down by while I'm eating lunch. Like if something's, you know, electrocuting. And I, 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 so I'm like, I need to track this sound down to what it is. And it was a scarab beetle in a pile of sawdust going, bzz, bzz. Uh, and so there it is all dusty. And you can see I'm making some art in the background there. I set it down on the wood and look at that thing. It's like, I didn't even know we had scarab beetles. And I took, I just, I felt in that moment, like the old gods were coming through and saying, we, we got you, we're, you know what I mean? And I felt like at that point, uh, whether it's true or not, it doesn't even matter. But like in my own personal art making practice, I was like, the work was, it got done right then. Everything after that, like all of this and all, you know, everything else is, is very cool. But that's what, that's when the work got done, you know, like the, the work happened when that beetle showed up and that's it, it, it curled up and ex it pulled its legs in and it looks exactly like the Egyptian amulets. Um, meanwhile, the PRS was reissuing the sec uh, secret teachings of all ages through Tashin, as you know, uh, Tashin. And um, I was you know, ordered a copy immediately and was unboxing it. And there's what is <laughs> their design for it was, is like the, so who knows, you know, what uh, the universe was saying or sending or, but there's, there's, there's something, there's something happening here. I don't know what, what it is and exactly clear, but <laughs> uh, it, it, we're all one, you know, and, and uh, it was just a, a wink, a nod, an interesting synchronicity. Um, another thing, Another book in Bucky's library was the, the Zohar or Book of Splendor on the, uh, the Kabbalah and the Tree of Life. Again, highly notated, lots of marginalia through the book. And um, I'd been asking for years if um, Buckminster Fuller was aware of um, esoteric traditions in academic places. And it was like, oh, no, no, no. This is a man of science and rational thinking and engineering. And, that, and don't even mention that in here, you know, and uh, I'm like, well, God, it really echoes and seems familiar. But so, you know, there's your your tree of life, you know, ladder from the mundane material up to the, uh, you know, spiritual at Kether. Uh, so I took while while I was drawing the dome, Bucky's house for the fundraising in Carbondale, looking at it from an aerial view, I could not help to see the tree of life diagram jumping out of the geometry. That's why I was asking people if he was aware of it. And I was also simultaneously, I was reading a book uh, by a rabbi on the Kabbalah that was called God is a verb. And that's one of Bucky's famous quotes. God is a verb. You know, God is known through its actions. It's, 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 uh, and so this is the aerial view of Bucky's house, central Pentagon there. The ones that you saw in the pictures, the little blue and white one. Now, this is the tree of life diagram laid on top of it. Uh, and that's all the, the Sephiroth. Uh, and if you go and rotate it at 72 degrees, it makes the, it hits every single vertice. So that split my head open. Like I, I like that put me down a real rabbit hole of like, I, I want to, you know, make art that resonates in this way. Um, I did uh, that piece out of reclaimed wood and um those those the points of that pentagram star are the are the is the tree of life it's that shape a hexagon nested into a pentagon with the um uh isosceles triangles around it but so that makes that pentagram and then this is uh installing those same shapes those i mean not everybody needs to know that those are tree of life diagrams uh that's just geodesic geometry but it's deeper than that, you know? And so I put five of them around in this thing that's on Carbondale's campus. The, it's called Bucky's Haven, uh, which this, yeah, this, this is a, a real, for me, it feels like a real temple, you know? And uh, it's sort of there, Bucky's Haven. Um, another interesting thing that, and, you know, forgive me if I'm going on, um, uh, but I'm about to wrap it up here. Um, Something in 2017 in Carbondale, uh, a total eclipse transited over Carbondale. And it was one of the few college towns. So a lot of, you know, NASA was there, 
NPR, Science Friday, a lot of people in town. And the the, the dome wasn't secure. It, we were still renovating the inside. And it, it was, it couldn't, you couldn't lock it well. And the board was like, somebody needs to stay in the dome. I'm like, I'll stay in the dome for the for the, for the eclipse. So yeah, get ready for a dorky uh, picture. But there there I am at the uh looking like a real tourist at the dome on the the day of the eclipse. And uh, I thought, well, this is auspicious. Um, I should, and I went up into Bucky's loft library, that circular library. And I thought, well, where in this house would he have invested the most energy and time? And I, I had always had like a, a, a pet theory that I mainly just shared with my kids and stuff to tease them like that libraries and bookshelves and books are portals of energy because of the writer's energy, the, all the reader's energy, and just you get a whole bunch of them together. And that's a, so much energy that it opens a portal. And the way that we know that is because movies, our collective dreams, always put the secret room behind the bookcase. Like you were to go into the, <laughs> and I, so I'm like, oh, we're watching Scooby-Doo. I'm like, see, look, I told you there's a, that's the, the portal. The, the the books create the portal. And then that movie came out, uh, Interstellar, or, or no, uh, the one where Matthew McConaughey goes through a black hole and then communicates with his family through the bookcase. Does anybody remember the title of that? Interstellar. Yeah. So I'm like, oh my God, this is true. It's true. It's not just the theory. Um, so anyway, where did I say the prayer and Thanksgiving on the eclipse to Bucky in the library? Like now his, his ghost did not materialize, but it felt auspicious and it felt good. And um, within three months, I got a phone call from, from Jamie Snyder, Bucky's grandson. He said, I got your phone number from my mom. And he said, I was outside uh, last night looking at the super moon in August. He's like, I got an overwhelming heart feeling that we should donate the library books back to the library. And I mean, like that was like a hair standing up kind of moment. So I felt like, you know, there's just something here, you know, and the, uh, you know, the lunar eclipse is the integration of masculine and feminine symbolism of the solar sun and the lunar. And then when they align with each other, that's the hermetic uh, work being done. That's the integration that needs to happen in the hemispheres. And these I made uh, for this show that are in the gallery as like little homages or totems to the magic of a eclipse. Um, um, I don't know if you want me to say this, but uh, I won't say it. Uh, a cool rock star bought these, which was awesome, which is, can only happen in LA, which is why I'm here. So uh, they're going to get installed at his house on, on Sunday, but I'm very stoked for that. Um, so again, so that's like the thing, like, there's something auspicious about the moon. I need to recognize that. It's like make these things with from from the heart and make them out of things that are, um, you know, trash or have these things have resonance with communications and being telephone poles, old telephone poles that you know they the when they they're junk and they take them down. I was like, I'll take those. Uh, that's the that's the literal architecture of our uh, telecommunications and communications. And their posts, and we post, we post online, and we communicate. And so those those things are all the symbolic things that made it feel real. Um, that's this is also the show. Now with the eclipse, that transit that went across the country August twenty first, uh, twenty seventeen. There's another total eclipse coming across the country in the opposite direction in twenty twenty four, and they cross at Carbondale. <laughs> so you tell me what's going on here. And I, I went to school there and more specifically where they cross is out in a national forest called Shawnee National Forest. And I had a, I had a transcendent, you know, ex transformative experience in the national forest at the lake where they cross when I was like 18 years old. It was in a, a camping trip in a cave behind a waterfall. And I, I can't go into the details about it, but I, I wasn't the same after this. And um, for, so for this, for me personally, is, is, is wild. But, um, you know, I'm just I'm just paying I'm paying attention, I'm, you know, and I'm, I'm living I'm living into it. So uh, that's what the art making practice is about, uh, you know, having a way to uh, 
to to catalyze all of this feeling and stuff and put it into the world. Um, and you know, everybody who came tonight, I want to say thank you. And you you all get a exhibition poster signed and numbered uh, afterwards. <laughs> and the gallery is open, so I would love to show you the gallery. I'm gonna I'll go out there. I'll, I'll sign these these uh, exhibition posters and number them and print them. And I know I went on uh, for quite a while, but I'd be happy to answer any questions. Just please, if you, I would really love it if you had questions, but use the mic because like last time we did it and people on um, on Zoom couldn't hear it. But, um, you know, anybody that has it, not even a question, like if any this talk stimulated something you want to testify or bear witness that, yes, you know, to, you know, don't leave me hanging alone. <laughs> on this but i know david Orr's probably got a question doug jacobs is is a bucky playwright and bucky scholar he can correct everything that i i i got wrong oh look thank you like, yeah uh thank you that was amazing yeah yeah um is it leonard slain's work that you were referring to with the the word yeah being... yeah yeah the yeah al uh, alphabet versus the goddess yeah the brain surgeon leonard slain did you, you read that yeah I haven't read it, but I've studied his work a bit, and it kind of gave me an ex existential crisis as a writer, feeling like the, know, the, yeah. the, the written word is part of the problem. Yes. And what do you mean? Yes. So how is is that? I mean, you're a visual artist, I, and right? How does that affect, like, how you learning that? How did that affect your artistic process? So I listen to audiobooks. I get an oral, uh, uh, but someone I. You know, all of this stuff, like the 90th Meridian and this and that, like I share this orally and academic people are like where they want to know where it's written down because it doesn't it's not true unless it's, there's a record, there's a written record, it's written down. I'm going to I'm going to write a book I'm gonna, and I'm so I'm going to I don't know how I feel about it. You know what I mean? Like, but it's like it has to be done, but I don't know. I haven't figured it out. The artwork stands and does its thing, but. There's still a world that if it's not written down, then it ain't true. So there's a way, there's a way to keep the balance somehow, right? If you figure I it hope out. So. Let me know. <laughs> yeah. For writers. Yeah, I love reading. I love writing, but yeah, I don't know. We just went too hard on it, all in on it, and you know, demonized everything else. Like it's the devil if it's not the word. You know, it's so, and that's a that's that's why. I got, I, you know, like this, this deity, this entity, this extra dimensional being that's posing as God, you know, and like using this tool to, you know, keep focus on it and then move our brains into more of a patriarchal thinking phase that's messing everything up needs to get uh, subverted. And, you know, it, I don't know. That's, that's the, the story I made up for myself around language, but I don't know. I uh, no, I it's true, right? Yeah. It's the demiurge. It's the demiurge. If there was the word. And that's, that's it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But that that entity knows is it knows enough about the true source of things to be a good imposter of the source of things, to be able to get everybody singing its song and dancing it. You know. It, so, yeah, that's probably a pretty heretical thing to say. But um, the the scarab came and said. You're fine. You're fine. Okay. <laughs> well, Leonard Slane's daughter, uh, Tiffany Slane, like she talks about how the internet is merging our sides of the brain. So we're okay. It's all oh, that's true. Yeah. Like emojis and things of that nature. Yeah. Yeah. But it, it, there's an, you know, there's, there's no, there's some new side effect of that, that we'll have to reckon with, but that'll be for the, the yeah. next 2000 years. Come on down. Hi, thank Hi. you. That was wonderful and packed. Thank you. No, I appreciate it. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Okay, so I wanted to say just a couple of things. I got to, when I was an undergraduate student, I got to hear Bucky speak. Oh, terrific. And it was, a, it was really literally a numinous experience for me. He was a keynote speaker at a graduation in San Francisco. And, um, I remember that I had never heard a visionary speak before. Yeah. And I, you know, I was, I was so struck. And the thing that I, I felt, I came away feeling like I had felt a pyramid 
speak. He, he sp- I, I, I love that. Yeah, did. And with, I saw that quote about the sermon in the song, you know, yeah, the yeah. pyramid. But that's how it felt. And I, I remember a friend of mine's father going, "What was that about?" Yeah. That? I said he was like a pyramid. He spoke. Yeah. He he started at the base, and it just yeah. took us all. He built. Yeah. And as he took us all to the top, I had never experienced that before, and I was just, it was numinous. So I wanted to share that. Yeah, I'm, and, I'm jealous. <laughs> and then I wanted to share a couple of things. Um, uh, uh, Jungian, I, I'm a Jungian scholar. And, and yeah. one of the things that, that Jung said about the world of advertisers, he said he compared them to the, um, the dark magicians of the, of the medieval ages. Yeah. Because they spun a worldview in which we are all entrapped and serving a, a corporate design and such a worldview that we can't imagine there's another way of being. Right. Yeah. Also, if regarding the scarab, one of the stories of synchronicity that is most famous of Jung's in, in terms of synchronicity is he's with a very skeptical client of his and she's telling him a dream of this Egyptian scarab. <laughs> and he keeps hearing this tapping at his window and the tapping at the window and the tap. Yeah. <laughs> Finally, he opens it up and it's a scarab. He grabs it and wow. shows it. They're good. <laughs> yeah, those scarabs are good. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Thank you for yeah. sharing those. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for sharing. Yeah. Those. David Orr. <laughs> I've known this guy for five or six years and I'm still asking him questions. <laughs> um, I I wanted to actually, I was, I was always fascinated by the fact that you listened to Manly Hall's lectures as you worked in your workshop. Uh-huh. And I'm wondering if there are any sort of primary manifestations of that in the work. For sure. Um, Everything about the Kabbalah and the Sefer Yetzirah and, you know, the word and how the, you know, the individual syllables work and, you know, the, all of that is Manly P. Hall. Um, now, you know, I thought, wow, this is, this is explains the way the world is you know, like, this is really powerful wisdom. This is powerful knowledge. Like, you know, now on the other side of it, it's like, well, that was that was the old era yeah that was the era of pisces you know what i mean like in so that's what like subverting that with this new work mm-hmm. is in some ways um i don't know you 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 listen to you imitate a master you you know you listen to a master you imitate a master you create like them and then it's your job to get rid of your master or get rid of your guru you know, I, I, and I think that like coming here is like, I still have a lot of love for him and stuff, but he was unpacking that whole old order that is, um, you know, needs to be the past, you know, and, uh, but so that, yeah, all of that is, is through the, all the new work, especially uh, in the piece that's called uh, decolonized where it's the um, it's actually I had a colony paint sign. So I was like, okay, I'm already dealing with colony. I saw a face come out of it. I painted the face. It looked like the traditional bearded, you know, cloud guy. I'm like, oh, wow, the Demir, the colonizer, the mind colonizer is showing, coming through this. And then I'm like, oh, I'm going to use, and then it had like a, this paint. So I had peacock feathers and there were seven and they correlated with the colors of the septenaries. So then I did the Hebrew letters seven doubles of the Sefer Yetzra. And then I did the three mothers, the uh, Aleph, Mim, and Shin, fire, air, and water balanced in his tongue uh, in the, in the scales. And then the 22, or I'm sorry, the, the 12 singles. And so that was the piece that was like really informed by what I learned from Manly P. Hall about that wisdom tradition. And then like uh, addressing that, the, the um, Demiurge through that piece that and, that and that's working on it is when I spooked myself out and the, and the scarab showed up. So yeah, yeah, that's manly P hall influence all the way. And then 
Yes, I'm a ringer. Um, <laughs> I well, one one story that I would love for you to tell everybody okay. here was uh, your, how the contractors reacted. Oh yeah, yeah. When Bill, you were building your own home. Yeah, that, th these are guys. Thank, thank you, David, for helping me remember stuff. Uh, the uh, you know, ten dollar an hour labor. Nobody had driver's license. I'd go around and pick them all up in the morning. And uh, the, that's that's you know, we're we're building and. I, there's a one uh, I noticed one of the main beams, like where it would be buried in the wall. One guy kept going over there and writing these numbers and he had a whole list of them. And I'm like, what's up? Were you trying to, were you remembering those? He's like, no, these numbers re are repeated throughout this entire house. There's only like three or four numbers that I, oh, that we, we see as we're building this house. And I'm like, wow, that must be a byproduct of using fee ratios in the house. And so that was cool. And I told them and then got them all in on it. And I said, oh, and by the way, on December 21st, and I, I did a, a line on the floor, the, the, the sun, the shadow of the sun will be here. And on June 21st, it'll be here. And they're like, yeah, right, we'll see. And I put wrote the date on there. And, they're, you know, they're, and like it's creeping to the, you know, and, I mean, you have, they would have thought like it was a wizard or something like that. But, you know what I mean? It's just like, it's just BC technology. You know what I mean? It's like old old math, but um, yeah, it, that was, that was fun to get those. And that became a real source of pride for those guys. Some of them have passed away since, but like, you know, they would bring their kids and like I built this house and we built this together. So, I mean, it almost gives, puts a lump in my throat thinking about those guys, because when you build from a lumber yard, um, you, you go around all that, you know what I mean? Like people were telling me like, you're an idiot, how much money you're spending on labor on that thing. I'm like, this is going to your, our neighbors are getting this. It's not a big corporation getting this and paid by deforesting and making petroleum products. It's like, these are guys, you know, and then they go and they spend this money in the bar. You know what I mean? And the money stays in the community. I'm like, this is, yeah, it, it's just, it was just funny how doing things that way did all this other little stuff, you know, it showed up in all these funny little ways. It ain't easy though, but it's worth it. Um, my name is Nagasi. Hey, um, thank you so much for thank, coming thank and speaking you. today. Just, uh, I just want to make a comment on something I noticed. The, I believe it was the uh, theos theosophy symbol you showed earlier with the uh, kind of like two inverted pyramids with yeah. the snake going around it. Um, so my practice is mainly in comic books, and I like study a lot of like, lighting and drawing and whatnot. Yeah. And immediately, what I thought was I was trying to identify where the light source was in that image because yeah, one of the uh, pyramids is like very obviously in the dark. And yeah. then once you got into the dialogue about the, the uh, what is it, the eclipse being the union oh, of two yeah. forces, yeah, I could see that in that symbol. And I kept trying to imagine like a 360 view. And at first I was thinking yeah. like maybe the light source was in between the two pyramids. Yeah. But it it really does read like an eclipse, like now thinking back on it. I love that. Thank you yeah. for sharing that. I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to steal that and add it. In. <laughs> and then one more thing, just like ruminating on the whole, uh, the supremacy of the written word mm -hmm. over like oral traditions and whatnot. Um, I feel like oral traditions kind of allow people to, uh, to reinvent the locality of symbols better than like yeah. a written factual record where you're yeah. like Miyamoto died in this year. Right. And whereas like it could have been multiple people, like these names are floating on to other people and then yeah. actions follow patterns and whatnot. But it seems like a lot of the whole thing was about like, organizing classes because it seems like the written words a lot easier to give direct yep. control orders to whereas absolutely. as opposed to teaching the whole society how to build stuff absolutely you know but yeah those are my thoughts the, uh, and as a comic book uh, uh guy you probably appreciate the the pictographic you know the visual part of unless because it's less on the words i'll in all of that like i'll give you a name of someone to google it unless you already know about them a graffiti artist named ram lz who you know ram lz Yes. Yes. Well, he, he had past life memory of working as a Gothic monk doing illuminated manuscripts, doing the first drop cap letter. And then he imbued the graffiti art with that memory of how to use, how to execute word magic to, and he, the, you know, the, those costumes and stuff are all is his personal mythology of extra dimensional characters that have the earth on quarantine and use it as a bedding parlor 
on their betting on the different language systems, which language system will have dominance like Indo-European. So this it's called the letter races, but then like race is a double entendre for like, if you don't have access to good language, you know what I mean? Like if then you don't have access to power. And that was his whole thing. He's like, I'm going to, I'm going to take what I know and remember from my past lives and imbue graffiti art with it and gain name fame for the South Bronx. And, you know, so there's a, there's a, I, I wanted to talk about that today. Obviously I, I wedged it in here, but it, I mean, it's really, there's like deep, deep well of esoteric wisdom around the foundation of hip hop and the uh, nation of gods and earths, the 5% nation that splintered off from the nation of Islam. And uh, it's all, that's the, you know, the use of the word and the cipher. And I mean, it's a, I, yeah, check all that out. It's really, 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 really cool. Yeah. You just, Doug, you got to use the microphone. <laughs> you do. Um, I have about 300 things I'd like to mention, <laughs> but I'll, I'll try to keep it brief. Uh, when I was conceiving the play about Buckminster Fuller, uh, I was doing another show with a Latina composer and she couldn't do it. I'd met her at Sweat Lodges in the Eastern Sierras. And then I, she introduced me to Luis Perez Isha Nestle, who I first met up in Santa Barbara. And he's an expert in pre-Columbian music and builds pre-Columbian instruments. And he's sort of an amazing presence. And so I went to his house in Santa Barbara, but it's the first time I went to Allegra's house in Pacific Palisades uh, to sort of talk, to sort of woo her about writing a play about Bucky, which at first I think she was a little horrified. She didn't remember that later, <laughs> but she actually, uh, I won her trust. And But before I went to her house, I went to the Bodhi Tree bookstore <laughs> and I'm standing in line. It's a long line. It's not moving. And I look up and there's this copper colored book up on the shelf. Yeah. And it was the first edition of Bucky's first book, yeah. which they were selling for $50. So I bought it, took it to her. <laughs> then I went to meet... Uh, Luis Perez yeah. and Nestle in, in Santa Barbara with his family. And we were talking about this other show called A Quiet Love. Yeah. Uh, and uh, and then we finished talking and had a great conversation. Said, What's your next project? And he said, well, I think I'm going to write a play about Bucky Fuller. And he goes, Bucky. And he goes, <laughs> I read Bucky in high school in Mexico City, which was like in 1967, 68, yeah. which was when Mexico City was exploding yeah. in riots which is the same year I saw Bucky speak in 1968. And yeah. so, I mean, the, when you get into this world, the yeah. synchronicities start to be totally mind blowing. Yeah. And, uh, and so I went to, uh, I was driving across the country to do the play in Washington, DC at the arena stage. And my brother had just died the year before who dragged me to the Bucky lectures years ago. Mm. And I'm, I'm driving across the Mississippi River, which I was obsessed by when I was in high school and junior high, and I read Life on the Mississippi. And I used to have dreams about the Mississippi <laughs> River. So here I'm driving across this river, and Luis had told me a story of a drum maker in Mexico he, he hired to make a drum. The guy got bitten by a snake, and he almost died, and then he built this drum that had all the snake symbols in the drum. <sighs> So Bucky talked about rivers being snake spirits. So I'm crossing the great snake spirit of Mississippi. <laughs> and I call Luis and he goes, yeah, I taught in St. Louis at some point. You got to go to the Cahokia Mounds, which I've never heard of, which are right. these ancient pyramids in the middle of Mexico. And I went to see something called Cahokia and it was a white settlement. Yeah, and I, I finally it. found the real Cahokia Mounds. And then I drove to Carbondale for the first time to have dinner with Bill Perk and Elizabeth, yeah. uh, all those people, because I was on my way to D.C. I almost got a speeding ticket. And it, <laughs> uh, but, you know, somehow he let me go because I knew he knew I wasn't hanging around. But uh, so it was all these things. And then yeah. later I went to the Future Festival and he spoke there. <laughs> and, so I, and he gave a version of this speech. And now yeah. it's a much bigger version of the House speech. Yeah. yeah. So then... We kind of hit it off, but then later 
none of the actors were available. And so I said, well, I'll act the role at Carbondale, yep. where Allegra saw me do the role. And I was terrified because Allegra was there and I'm playing her grandfather. And, yeah. and then I, I look in the front row and there's a small woman right next to her is this big handsome man <laughs> smile looking at me smiling at me while i'm performing yeah. later but when i drove into carbondale what was playing on the car stereo was john coltrane's a love supreme yes yeah which i realized I has it. this heartbeat in yeah uh, love which love is an important supreme. rhythm in the play yeah and uh his his father he died of a heart attack his father i think died of a heart attack and and so that it, it, i i <laughs> Thank you. The We're synchronicities just, just get insane. Yeah, yeah. But, the synchronicities is uh, something really the there. The Mississippi River and yeah, the that Mississippi whole, River Valley and how the 90th follows it, and it really is like an energetic spot. Yeah. That, that Kundalini snake spirit of the spine of the you know, it's like it's all it's all there. To As a teenager, I used I read Life on the Mississippi, and then for ten or twenty years, I would have dreams of the Mississippi River. Yeah, and uh, riverboat. <laughs> Should have been a riverboat captain. It's very, very. <laughs> well, I just gave a speech, but we'll talk about that later. Yeah. The dovetails with these triangles. It's the origins of the theater. The, the play, yeah, yeah. The theater. The, how the theater developed out of Oh, perfect. Hi. Hi. Hi, that was great. Oh. I was a fan of Glad you enjoyed it. Uh, the things that I was thinking of tonight was, um, you know, when I hear the word dome, I always think of the word oculus. You know, I always mm -hmm. think of the eye and I always yeah. think of, you know, when I went to Rome and I was in the Pantheon and I was in all these beautiful buildings, basilicas, and how they were all built on top of rectangles. And then Bucky's putting triangles, half rectangles in you know, to me, it's like that joining of the masculine and feminine. You put yep. the triangles inside the 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 dome because the to me the the dome is the earliest version of like sweat lodges yeah. and you know what we what we lived in. So I think we're kind of coming to this age where you know where we used to kind of go into buildings and we were separate from the the divine feminine of yeah. the of the oculus yeah. of the womb. Yeah, that it's kind of he's putting putting it on the ground yes you know and he's taking away the rectangle yeah so i feel that was what was conjuring in my head tonight amen yeah and yeah. he's not a he's not erecting towers he's exactly. not a tower erector. yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> you know yeah. The, the ego thing. yeah he's bringing yeah. you know the domes down onto onto the air yeah but i think there's also something where something isn't working where we're living inside of i mean there's uh domes all around california and chile and they withstand earthquakes and yeah uh fabulous things but there's something that's i think they're ga great gathering centers mm -hmm. for for community yeah. but i think there is something that um can be built around um the 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 pie and the you know like cities and things that would make it uh, more harmonious i agree yeah, yeah. The, uh, the towards the end of his life, he was realizing that the dome makes a good exterior envelope to yeah. it could be a, even a rectilinear building or or something more conventional in the dome. Yeah. But that air, you know, like how your heat pump works, you know, yeah. Um, it that that air inside the dome is stays kind of moderate in temperature. Yeah. And um, but you know, he he passed before he could really fulfill that. Yeah. But it's, it's, it's similar to what you're describing. Yeah, because I used to know a man that used to make, build sweat lodges. And he would always carve out the bottom to make a sphere. Oh, yeah. Put certain things in the, you know, so you would just see the dome, but there was the other dome that was in the air. That's cool. I like yeah. That. Yeah. I've done sweats and it's like, yeah, that would feel a lot better. If, yeah. Yeah. If you like were you're down. in the sphere. Yeah. 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 Cool. So thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah. Of course. Yeah, sure. <laughs> hey um mars hey uh, appreciate everything you had to say man. thank you um your work is beautiful thank you your house is beautiful uh, <laughs> thank you. i'm sure it's wonderful to live in yeah um i was just wondering have you ever been to the giza plateau if no. so what did you think okay 
Um, yeah. Then in lieu of that, um, what is the most profoundly like powerful geometric place that you've ever experienced? I got to say that it's that um, dome there in Edwardsville. I just had never had architecture take you out of your body like that, that transcendent thing. And the whole of the Southern Illinois as a, as a landscape mm. is, uh, is called Little Egypt. Uh, SIU's mascot is a Saluki, which is an Egyptian dog. And the, the, the bottom of the, the state, the Mississippi forms this, and the Ohio River forms this. They meet at the bottom. And the town right here at the bottom is, is Cairo. They pronounce it Cairo. Mm -hmm. but, and the, and it, but it's all mound building. You know, these pyramids are in there. So that is like a landscape, like going to what they call Monk's Mound uh, in, in Cahokia. Um, that was the most profound uh, other than the dome itself. Like that, like I, I, I was for some reason found myself crying for no reason sitting up there because it was like, it just, I don't know. It's like the, I don't know. It was, I don't know why, but it was like, it was just so, there was just like this continuity through um, human life which probably like the plateau at giza would be a similar thing like i would love to go visit there but that cahokia monks mound at cahokia and then the dome and they're both on the 90th meridian in the area of little egypt but uh uh one other tidbit which i would love to have included but now i feel like i have a little opportunity yeah. uh the, the cahokian civilization that um which is you know research is showing that the mound building mississippian culture is almost identical to the the what they're finding in the Amazon Delta with mm. LIDAR, they're seeing all these mounds. And the purpose of elevating that mound was to get this plane uh, that the, the uh, priest would be able to have a good view of the horizon to spot uh, solstice, equinox, sunrises, and do the astrological work mm. from that elevated plateau. You you get to get a square, put the corners to all the, the four cardinal directions, and then start tracking and and really that's what that that building is it's a square and all the corners point to the, the four corners point to the cardinal directions and then there's this there's observation orientation uh thing so it's in that it's in that tradition uh and and then the mound building cultures are the indigenous wisdom keepers you know of of the, of the united states but the, the other thing was that um they have a character that was drawn on a cliffs and the bluffs down there on the Mississippi near Cahokia. That was, uh, it was a, it was like, it was a winged character. They called it a, a river dragon or, and it had a human face and it had antlers and it had wings and it had like, um, hooves. So it was, it was a classic, um, tetramorph or the, the, the thing that pulled the chariot of ascension. Uh, Ezekiel, you know, like uh, into this, the seven heavens, the, the, the you know, the, the, the Taurus, uh, you know, like the, the astrological, but which is what he was describing the, um, um, the star tetrahedron is, you know, the Merkaba or the yeah. chariot of ascension, you know, like for your light body and stuff. But it's just, it, it's just crazy because those people, there's a glow, there was a global, knowing then of these cultures uh, uh about this stuff um you know manly p hall talks about it and it, it's a little antiquated or a little outdated because they 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 connect it to atlantis you know like this global maritime civilization sure. that was seeding this wisdom all over the globe and not just saying like well that this is um something that human beings who are hearing the voice of nature arrive at um on their own independently regardless of what ancient aliens, ancient astronaut theorists have to say about this, yeah. <laughs> which may be true, I don't know. But um, if, strangely enough, Bucky had a similar theory that Bali uh, in Indonesia was the, was the first planet landed human civilization. He had that statement in his book, Critical Path. I called his grandson. I said, okay, so when Bucky says the, the Balinese culture was the first planet landed humans does he mean that he thought humanity was seated off planet he's like well 
he because I was going to give a talk about it and he's like I don't know if I would lead with that but uh he said he didn't think that the evolutionary record accounted for everything that we are as human beings which I, I'd have to agree with and it, him being a maritime guy he thought that um people you know on an island have to figure out how to manage their resources have to be able to get off the island so they have to innovate with um sails and tensions and ropes and they have to um, have a star map in their mind when they're navigating on the ocean, like wayfinders. Like all of that wisdom is born of people of a maritime civilization. And he, he, he uh, again, like what he does, identified his theory through the material heritage of artifacts of their fishing nets and baskets that they were weaving in this triangulated um uh, they were creating almost like a geodesic lattice in their baskets and fishing nets. And that was, that was really innovative. And there, they found them there. And then they, they found them, they found them there initially. And then they found them out in the middle of the Pacific ocean. And then they found them down near Eastern Island. And then they found them at South America. And so he said, these people were circumnavigating the globe, you know, 30,000 years ago. Yeah. Um, and everybody laughed at him. And then now they've, with genetic sequencing, they found out that the South American, you know, in, indigenous population, the Australasian, yeah, yeah, did not walk down through North America. Mm -hmm. So they had to have gotten there and they hadn't navigated. That was, they could be the descendants of the ancient maritime civilization. And that, that he claimed was there due to their artifacts and the way they did things. And so then that would be your the, what they're finding in the Amazon now. You know what I mean? Like these ancient mariners that would look at the horizon from the prow of their boat and, you know, spot when that's how they navigated. Like at dawn, what stars are on the horizon and at dusk, what stars are on the horizon. Got to keep a mental map of that. So if you now you're on land, you build an elevated mound building platform and you create that that same oceanic horizon and then you're you're a waykeeper or you're a, you have a wayfinder, you know, on, on land in that way. But anyway. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, thank you. It was a great segue. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. If you keep putting quarters in me, I'll keep like that. <laughs> sure, 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 sure. Well, when I drove through Cahokia and then went to Carbondale and met Bill Kirk, and I yeah. think they took me through the house and it was, they were just conceiving redoing it but he i think he told me or maybe you told me, i expect you to maybe talk about it because you talked about the golden mean oh yeah but in that library at the desk if he sat at his desk and he got up went down the st staircase circled through the kitchen out through the living room and out the front door it was the spiral of the golden mean i didn't know that had you ever heard that no that's great and then it would continue out to his car and he'd drive away <laughs> i love that i love that thank you for sharing that all right. Bill? Bill, Bill said that? Yeah, we lost Bill. Bill was the information keeper. He was one of Bucky's colleagues at Carbondale. You know, he was in the studio when Catherine Dunham came. Um, yeah, he. Uh, we miss him. Well, we'll go look at some art. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.